Steve, candlelight service, but leave the torches at home. Amen? All right. Isaiah chapter 35, beginning in, we'll look at verses 1 through 10 in a moment. As we talk about this morning, uh, a sermon entitled, There Will Be Singing. Now, Isaiah's a prophet who's writing about uh, Zion in this particular case. And Zion's representative of that place where one day after this race is over that you and I live in this world that we're going to get to. What, 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 is, what is it that, that drives joy? What is the thing that creates joy in our hearts? And the idea that they were going to go to this place and be with the Lord forever is the thing that gets everybody excited. And, and this is the thing we want to look at. We're going to focus focus on, because he talks about singing in this particular verse. I was doing an exegesis on this particular scripture. I'm looking at this particular word. I'm going to have you underline, and some of your words may be the word shouting when we get there. And that word shouting is is a weird kind of word in Hebrew that is operatic. I don't know if we're all going to sing like opera stars when when we come into heaven, And uh, it does say we have a perfect body, so I'm assuming our vocal cords become perfect at the same time. But today, we oftentimes don't have those opera stars, and we have a mix. I'm going to share with you three quick stories about this idea of music and singing, because I'm not really gifted in those kinds of areas. So as we look at that, I want to share with you about this guy, this man and his wife, who was browsing in a craft store one day when the man noticed a display of country-style musical instruments. And after looking over the flutes and the dulcimers and the recorders, he picked up a shiny one-string instrument that he uh, presumed to be a mouth harp. And he put it to his lips, and much to the amusement of the other shoppers that were there, twanged a few notes on it. And after watching from a distance, his wife came up and whispered in his ear, I hate to tell you this, honey, but you are trying to play with a cheese slicer. (laughs) Not all of us are musicians, right? It's your first story. The second one, a woman wanted to talk uh, talk to her parents who had uh, recently retired and her mom was always wanted to learn how to play the piano. And so her dad bought her mom a piano for her birthday. And a few weeks later, the woman asked uh, how her mom was doing with it. We returned the piano, the dad said. I persuaded her to switch to the clarinet instead. And she said, how come? He goes, well, he answered, because with the clarinet, she can't sing while she plays. (laughs) We're not all singers, right? We're not all musicians. We're not all singers. But we all can make a beautiful, joyful noise. Amen? Make a beautiful noise. Our last little story kind of illustrates this. It was a church in the north, old Catholic church, in which the choir director had gone to a great deal of trouble preparing an excellent soprano for a solo on Sunday's service, history tells us in this true story. As the soloist's beautiful voice soared through the church, She was suddenly joined by a bedraggled street person who had wandered in the side door and had taken a seat near the choir. The newcomer's voice had, well, had seen better days, and she quavered along, slightly off key, through the entire song. The choir members kept looking frantically at the director who made No move to interrupt the intruder. He just kept waving his arms in unison to the music as he was looking at this individual. Afterwards, some of the members of the choir asked the director why hadn't he stopped her. And he said, because I wasn't sure which song God would like better. Making a joyful noise. Making joy. It doesn't matter whether you can sing or whether you can play an instrument. The joy that comes from our hearts when we sing together as a family, when we sing together to the Lord, is a moving experience. And Isaiah the prophet writes that this experience is going to occur when we usher into this new Jerusalem, into this Zion. He goes, when all your cares are taken off of your shoulders, when everything that you stress about today or have anxiety for are removed... Now think about that. Eternity, billions and billions of years. 
not 70 years that we might live or 80 years or 90 years that we might live, but billions of years are just the tip of eternity that you will have fulfillment, it says, completely in that heaven. That the, the joy that we, that we walk into this place with will be none like we could ever or have ever been able to experience on this earth. I would like to think that this season of the year without the great Christmas carols and, and songs uh, would be different. When we're driving up and down the highway, we turn on Christmas music now. And I'm sure you do, and you're listening to it, and you have it in the home. And as the kids were wrapping their presents last night for each other, we played Christmas music in the house. And you could see the, the joy on their faces. They were wrapping their gifts for each other as they were listening to the music. But times are changing there was a time when groups would go out into neighborhoods. As a matter of fact, 10 years ago, I took our church out into the neighborhoods and we sang Christmas carols. And we went out there, and, but things are just a little different. You'll notice the tradition is almost extinct, that people are just not going out singing Christmas carols anymore. There's this new thing called virtual caroling. Have you ever heard of that? A couple... People figured out that somehow they could take an iPod and they would go to a house and they would uh, get the iPod to link directly to their TV set at home through a camera or a computer. And they would go leave the iPod on the steps and ring the doorbell and leave. And the lady would bend over and pick up the iPod and it would start and on the iPod on the screen would be all these kids singing Christmas carols. She recognized the kids because they were her neighbors. And they were the kids from the neighborhood. And she looked at the screen and she saw them all singing on it. And then she looked over to the house. And there in the window were the kids waving at her who had placed it there. And this has become a trend among places throughout uh, the country where people would do this virtual caroling. It's different, but it's no wonder that YouTube has thousands of caroling videos that now you shoot to people. And they shoot people a caroling video instead of going to the house and singing. Well, today's... Prophecy from Isaiah tells us that when the Messiah comes, there's going to be singing. And there are a few, pa there's a very few passages as joyful as Isaiah 35, as we look at Isaiah 35. This idea that the, the desert and the parched land will be glad. Look at Isaiah chapter 35, beginning in verse 1. It says, The wilderness and the desert will be glad. And the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and a shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, and there will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, the recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be open, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. If you'll recall this prophecy uh, last week when we talked about this, and, and, and John said, is this Jesus Christ the Messiah? And he said these very words. The deaf hear, the blind can see, and he encourages them that the Messiah has come. And John knew of the, of the Messiah, and he knew of the writings in Isaiah. And he knew what it, was, what it was for, that these things were going to happen as the Messiah comes, but something happens near the end. For the waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah, verse 7. The scorched land will become a pool and a thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, it is a resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. Isaiah the prophet writes about this idea that 
and he uses this, this area that they were used to seeing in the arid lands, the Arabah around them. They, they were used to seeing those things. They knew that a parched land was a parched land, that when they looked out there, they didn't see green grass. They didn't see rushes growing. They didn't see pools or ponds or those kinds of things. They saw desert. They saw rock. They saw, they saw an arid place. And, and this idea of beauty, this idea that the world would be made over new again was foreign to them. And he says, but he will do those things and he will follow through that these things will be changed. Now watch this. The writer Isaiah, the prophet, is saying this, and, and this, we need to grasp it, that this arid area in your life is about to change. He says it will change. And this is, this is the thing that becomes so important to share. Now here's your verse in verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting. Underline that word right there, joyful shouting. That word shouting right there in, in Hebrew means to sing, but sing in an operatic fashion. So the writer here is, is caught between writing the shout and a singing verse. It says, and come with joyful shouting or joyful singing to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, watch this, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. You ever been so tired that you just went like this? You ever had pressure on you so great in your home that you, you don't have any more words, you just are like, it takes the breath out of you. You don't know what to do. God says, watch this, I am going to forever take that away from you. What an exciting truth. What an exciting truth that that would come to fruition. It would be difficult to paint a picture in which the joy of the Lord is portrayed more vividly than that. They will enter Zion with singing. Music is very important to us at Christmas time. We hear it all the time. We have it on the radio. The Gospel of Luke doesn't actually tell us that the angels were singing in the heavens, as oftentimes is misquoted, when Christ was born. But we would like to think that they were. The verse from Luke's Gospel actually reads, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Luke tells us they were saying, not singing would like to think that they were singing. Someone's defined the difference between rap music and opera like this. Opera is people singing when they should be talking, and rap is people talking when they should be singing. Maybe the angels were rapping out the message to the shepherds, but probably not. I still think that we uh, will be singing, according to the prophet Isaiah, when we enter into God's majesty. Music is a wonderful gift of God. And I want to look at a couple things here. Victor Hugo quoted this. He said, music attempts to express what cannot be said about something on which it is impossible to remain silent. I like that. It helps explain why music is such an integral part of Christmas. First thing this morning, music gives us the opportunity to express our joy and thanksgiving. You ever notice when you're singing? Have you ever sang a song together corporately as a church and it, you get a tear in your eye? Watch this. When our total focus is on God and we're singing to him and all of a sudden that verse hits you in the heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, I have your total attention. And all of a sudden, you break. All of a sudden, you have this conviction. All of a sudden, you get tears in your eyes because of the song. And you can't figure out why that's true. It just happens. Sometimes you'll see Pastor Ben singing, and, and you think when he pulls away from the mic that he is just pulling away from the mic to clear his voice. Oftentimes, he's pulling away from the mic because he's about to get choked up while he's singing. I'll be singing, I was singing this morning on that last verse, just listening to the words of the Lord as we focus on them, I get choked up and a, and a tear comes to my eye and I, here I am wiping my eyes before I have to get up and preach. It happens, watch this, it happens when we are totally focused solely on Jesus Christ. 
And if we would do that, that joy that you get from that is amazing. It's a joy that's promised in Scripture. It's a joy that changes in a huge way. There was a preacher from another generation who once said about a Methodist friend of his, he said this, and I quote, I used to know this old Methodist guy, and the first thing in the morning when he got up, he began singing a bit of a hymn. And if I met the old man during the day, he was always singing. It was irritating. I have seen him in this little workshop that he worked in with his lapstone on his knee, and he was always singing and beating with his hammer at the same time. He would say, Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. And he would do it in time as he worked. He says, I couldn't ever understand this. And so I asked him one day, he says, why do you always sing, brother? Why? And he replied simply, because I always have something to sing about. Have words ever left you? Has joy left? Are you missing something? Does this sound foreign to you? Like, I, I don't have that joy. Am I really missing something? Watch this. This is hard for me to say as your pastor. I would say yes. You're missing the joy of the Lord that can only be found when you're completely focused on him. That's a good enough reason to sing. And in Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah promises the people that they will one day return to Zion. Zion is symbolic of Jerusalem, of the promised land. Isaiah was writing during the times, ironically, of a divided kingdom. Now, the land had been overrun numerous times, as the writer writes here in his prophecy in the book of Isaiah. They had been overrun by their enemies. They were prisoners of war at the time, and they had been carried off to become slaves in different lands in this writing. And Isaiah promises that one day they will be able to return home to Zion, the city of God. For them, this will be a time of great joy, and so they sing. He was prophesying about us in this arid time of life, in a place where we're lost, in a place that we keep trying to find hope, in a place that we keep trying to fix on our own, that he says, you won't be able to do it. You will never have joy in your life until you say, I am choosing to go to Zion. I'm choosing to follow the Lord. For Christmas, Zion, watch this. For Christmas, watch this, Zion is that city of God, which is heaven. And again, when we enter into that place of eternal promise, there will be singing for those of us who know Christ's love in our hearts. There will be a need to say thank you to God for what God has done for us. Charles Duke was a former astronaut on Apollo 16. He came to Christ some years after walking on the moon. He was the 10th man, as a matter of fact, to walk on the moon, a graduate of MIT, and then going on to the Naval Academy. He graduated the Naval Academy and joined the Air Force. Sorry, Brother Aiden. He, and, and he joined the Air Force, and he became an astronaut, and he walked on the moon, and he had this stellar career as the 10th man to walk on the moon on the Apollo 16 mission. But after his time with NASA, he lacked purpose. Watch this. This man who accomplished so much, MIT graduate, naval graduate, accomplished aeronautics expert, astronaut. He lacked purpose and meaning in his life. He contemplated suicide. His wife, Dottie, was also troubled, history tells us. In fact, she contemplated suicide. History tells us about this lady that she began to attend a church in North Carolina where she gave her life to Christ. Sometime later, at his wife's Bible study, Charles Duke, the astronaut, 10th man on the moon, how would you like to have that in, in a dinner setting? You know, the dinner setting where the guy's always bragging about himself. Well, you know what? I had this company and I did this. And then you get to say, well, I walked on the moon. 
that kind of shuts that, that story down. Charles Duke, though, a guy whose past was his, in his past and he didn't have a hope in his present, goes to his wife's Bible study and he gives his life to Jesus Christ as well. He found a new compelling purpose for his life and today he offers this comment on his conversation when talking about space. He says, walking on the moon cannot compare with walking on earth with Jesus Christ. Here's a guy who walked on the moon. (laughs) And he says out of his lips, as we look at this guy and say, wow, this guy is is amazing. He says, it doesn't compare with my walk with Christ. Now, here's the tougher question, 2019, almost at the end of it, right here where you are. Are you that excited about walking with Jesus? And here's the second question. You can't be if you're not walking next to him. It's like these songs when we sing and they bring tears to our eyes or we get choked up. It's in that moment when we're in complete focus that then joy becomes present. I think oftentimes as Christians, I know this is true with me, I'll find myself wandering away trying to do things on my own and becoming so busy and so consumed with life I lose all joy. I lose sight of hope. The second thing we need to understand is that there's music does for us, it draws us closer together as the family of Christ. Music draws us closer together as a family of Christ. In my mind, I can see the band of refugees, Isaiah envisions returning to their homeland, singing as they travel. I love the part of the congregation that is singing when, when we're singing here and, and, and Pastor Ben pulls off the mic and, and from the front I can just hear the congregation singing. And when they're really into the song and everybody's lifting their voice, especially when they say everybody sing together and we all raise our voices together. It doesn't matter who is in key and who is not in key It is a blessing to the Lord to hear his children singing to him. And it sounds good. It sounds great. I love to be a part of a congregation that is singing. When somebody suggests a Christmas carol or a Christmas song and everybody sings it together. There was a famous musician named Rich Mullins. Some of you remember him as Christians. He was an artist and a songwriter in a world of contemporary music, and uh, he was tragically killed in a Jeep accident riding off-road in 1997. He had written a ton of of beautiful songs and praise songs that touched many hearts of people, but he had this friend named Eric Hawk. Eric was a close friend to Rich, and he recalled him being in a worship service just days before he died. Some friends wanted to gather and praise God, and everyone had brought instruments to play together, and the music, he said, sounded awful. Even the leaders were singing out of tune. And Rich later went up to the microphone and said, I love to be in church. I love to listen to people sing and play from their heart. He says, in my profession, we worry about being in tune and sounding good all the time. But this music tonight... I believe is most pleasing to God because it is so real. And it comes from the hearts of the children of God. That was the last time Eric ever saw Rich Mullins. That was the last time he sang out of key. And to him, that sounded the best God. And I believe that when we sing with our heart completely focused on God, we A, know joy, and B, we please God. Our Heavenly Father. Some of us can understand that. Some of you have cried during songs that you sing. We know about the power of music to draw people together in worship. It reaches across boundaries of social status, gender, and race. And and in a, a society that we are constantly inundated with this kind of stuff, we need to be focus and understanding of what's happening around us. 
that God doesn't care who you are. He just wants a relationship with you. There was a cultural exchange program, and a rabbi, a Jewish guy from Russia, was visiting with a Christian family in Texas. And since it was Christmas, the family wanted to take him to some of the finest places in Houston, which is where they lived. So they all went to a favorite Chinese restaurant. Throughout the meal, the rabbi uh, talked about the wonders of America and comparison to the bleak conditions of his homeland in Russia, where he was from. And when they had finished eating, the waiter brought the check, which was a fortune cookie, and a small brass Christmas tree ornament as a present for the rabbi. They all laughed when the rabbi pointed out that the ornament on it was stamped made in India. But the laughter soon subsided when they saw that the rabbi was quietly crying. And they all thought that the rabbi must have been offended by receiving a Christmas tree as a gift, but that wasn't the reason. He smiled and he shook his head and he said, no, I was shedding tears of joy to be in a wonderful country. I'm in a Chinese restaurant in which a Buddhist gives a Jew a Christmas tree by, made by a Hindu. <laughs> Think about that. Because watch this. Heaven is going to look a lot like that. He doesn't care where you're from or what your background is or what color you are, how much money you make, what your social status is. What he cares about is a relationship with you personally. He desires a relationship with you. Christmas reminds us that Christ came to shine his light into the heart of everyone on this earth. Of whatever race or creed, when we sing, we sing as a family of God. And I've often wondered why God created us with voices that are so different. The soprano can hit high notes. The bass can sing so low. But we blend in one voice into one glorious sound. To me, it easily qualifies as proof of God's existence when we look at that. Why would blind evolution give us such a gift? It doesn't make sense. Music calls us together into one beautiful family, especially at Christmas. When we sing joy to the world and hark the herald angels sing, and what child is this? And this Christmas candlelight service when we sing Silent Night together, I always get choked up. Because together as we sing it, it's just one family. I believe angels sing with us when we praise God. When the Messiah comes, the Bible says there will be singing. Singing allows us to express our joy and thanksgiving. Singing draws us closer together. So here's the last point this morning in the sermon. Most importantly of all, music speaks to us of God. Several years ago, there was an article in a church journal about a church in Jackson, Tennessee that used music to help what are called at-risk children. They used volunteer piano teachers who gave lessons to underprivileged children. The idea worked. Pride, self-esteem, academic performance. Among all these kids with disadvantaged backgrounds were all enhanced. Not only that, but the program caught the attention of the Rockefeller Foundation for Fine Arts in New York, and the foundation thought the program might be developed nationally. So they sent a world-renowned pianist Lauren Hollander, to go to Jackson and take a look at this program. <clears throat> While Hollander is there, history tells us, he shared something significant with his audience. He shared with them of his own experience of being a battered child. They didn't know this about Holland when they sent him there. They found out about it after he got there. He said there was a lot of children out there who are mortally wounded in the soul these are children who are battered spiritually and creatively, creatively. And when Hollander said this, he said the music can bring the spirit of love into the lives of these children who have become lost by allowing them to discover creativity in music. 
They began to express the divine love of God. And finally, Mr. Hollander had this to say. When I was a child and first heard Bach, I told my sister we didn't have to be afraid of the dark anymore because someone is watching over us. I heard it in the music. As Ben comes forward and and we get ready to close, put your Bibles away. And let's try to grasp what Isaiah is saying with his singing as we enter Zion. He says, music speaks to us about God. That's why music has always been part of the church. That's why music is a big part at Christmas. Have you ever wondered why when you sing, have you ever wondered why when you sing, sometimes it brings a tear to your eye? Because perhaps God is trying to communicate to you through what he created. So let's prepare for the birth of the Christ child. Tonight will be a play. A bunch of kids jacked up on Kool-Aid and cookies and excited to perform for their parents and their grandparents. And a community can gather around with them and sing together or sing along. I think a lot of eloquent sermons, fancy words, don't amount to much when we just take God's plain word, we read it, and then we lift our voices to him. I think church perhaps needs to be a lot more simple. Christ died for you because he loved you. The gift of Christmas is a Christ child who intentionally went into Jerusalem as a man and walked out with the cross to give us something that we could never pay for you, something we could never afford. Isaiah writes about entering into Zion with singing. An everlasting joy, watch this, an everlasting joy will crown their heads. Everlasting joy. Gladness and joy, he says, will overtake them. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. That's the promise of Christmas. That's the gift of the Christ child. And in a moment as we sing together, let us be reminded we sing to the Lord and not to the person next to us. That he's looking at your heart and he wants us to walk with him and not away from him. If you need to make a decision for Christ, I'm down here in the front, I'll pray with you. You come if you've never done that. What what, What better time is there than this to understand there's a gift with your name on it? If you are a Christian looking for a church home, maybe you need to say, you know what? I need to plug in. Whatever it is, as we sing and lift our voices to God, let's be reminded that Jesus Christ indeed is the reason for the season. Let's stand together.